Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be back in Northern California. And while I was sitting, waiting in the little room outside, where they locked me in, <laughs> as the time is not yet, I was thinking of my own childhood. I was remembering some very interesting facts of childhood. I do sometimes. Today I was thinking how I learned the English language. I was learning A, B, C, D, the whole alphabet. Every time I would start with A, B, C, D, I would stop at the letter S. And I wondered why. What is the significance that I should stop, read the rest of the alphabet rapidly and stop at S, then go to T, U, Y, and so on. As I have gone through life, I find that S contained some of the most significant words that I've ever that have affected my life. S, significant. Santmat, Sadguru. Sant Sadguru Savan Shah, S, 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 affected my life the most. Satsang, Simran. I kept on adding so many words that affected me. And now to top it all, Sonoma County and Sebastopol. <laughs> If I were to touch just upon a few of these words, I could talk to you for days on these words. But let me just touch upon a few of them, the important ones. In Santmat, the path of the saints, the path of the masters, the most important thing is the Satguru, the master himself. If there is no master, there is no Santmat. If people think that recorded events of what masters wrote, what masters spoke at one time, is Santmat, that is not true. Sant must, must have a living master who can talk to us, whose hand we can touch, who is a living person. The reason for this is very simple. As we will find in the study of the spiritual path, the only thing that is coming in the way of our achieving our own true home, such kind, satnam, again I am quoting all, all the S words, when we want to achieve that, we find the only real obstacle to our going back home is our own mind. Our mind creates the obstacles, nothing else. There is no enemy we have in this world. If there is an enemy, it's our own mind that comes in the way of our progress. Mind is a generator of doubts and fears. Mind becomes an obstacle. And if we want to rely upon reading of books, listening to speeches made by somebody else, who is interpreting them? Our own mind. And the mind has its own way. And we do not make any progress. It's only a living person who has his awareness at a level higher than ours who can tell us, no, this is not the interpretation. No, this is not what is meant. Because a Sant Satguru, a perfect living master, does not speak from any written books. He does not rely upon any scriptures. He is not a learned person. He speaks directly from his experience. He speaks what he is actually seeing at that time. He is aware of something that he is telling us. And he's not trying to speculate on anything. He's just telling us what he knows and what he can see right at that time. Therefore, a perfect living master is essential if you really want to practice the spiritual path. A perfect living master has to be perfect in the sense that he has attained a state of consciousness that goes beyond the mind. As I said, our mind creates imperfection. And therefore, a perfect master is one who has gone beyond the mind, does not need to think and to reason and to analyze and to do other mental activities to be able to talk to us, to be able to tell us what the spiritual path is. He is able to 
tell us directly from his own experience as he's having while he's talking to us. That's only possible with a perfect living master whose perfection is gone about the mind. And the imperfection that the mind creates is no longer preventing him from telling us the truth and guiding us. Moreover, we communicate with each other through the mind. Our languages are created by the mind. We live in the world of the mind. And therefore, it's quite possible that the perfect living master working for us and coming to us uses the mind like we do, communicates with us. But then behind that, he's using something else which does not belong to the mind. He uses the power of love. The power of love does not vest in the mind. No mind, no thinking can ever create love. Love is something that is born in the spirit, in the soul, in our true consciousness. Love is basic to our fundamental consciousness. It is not created by thinking. No mental activity can create it. Mental activity can subdue it, can sometimes destroy it. It cannot create it. Therefore, when we come across a perfect living master in our life, his method is one of pure love. He draws us by love. But because we operate through mind, he functions at our level and explains things to us through our mind and through his mind. And we think it's a nice teaching he's giving us, as if he is a good teacher. The truth is, a perfect living master is not a teacher. He pretends to be a teacher because we love teaching. We love to be taught. And therefore he teaches. Otherwise, his method is to draw us with his love, pure love. Love is what draws a soul to another soul. Love does not draw a mind to another mind. And therefore, the perfect Sant Sat Guru or perfect living master employs the best method, which is to draw us to his spirit and draws our spirit to his spirit through love. Therefore, his method is love. Ultimately, nothing succeeds on the spiritual path except love and devotion. You will notice that the rest is only a preparation. The rest is to keep the mind aside, to keep the mind from interfering. And therefore, the love and devotion that we find experience with the perfect living master is unmatched with any love and devotion we have ever seen. Why is that? Because we mistake attachment as love. We get attached to things and we think that is love. We get attached to our children, attached to our property, attached to cars and buildings and homes. And we get attached to our pets and dogs and cats. We get attached to everything and we say we love them. And yet, when we say we love them, you will notice that the word, I love my house, I love my cat, I love you. In this statement, what is the awareness telling that person? The awareness is saying, I love you, I am there to love you. The duality is very obvious. The I is more prominent than you. And therefore, it's an ego game most of the time. Love is different. In love, you don't think of the I, you think of the beloved. The beloved replaces the I in true love. Your whole consciousness is filled up with the beloved and the I has no place in it. The ego has no place in it. There's a very clear distinction between the two, but we make a mistake. And we think that the attachments we have in this world are love. And we misuse the word love all the time. And we think we have to repeat it again and again in order to ensure that we are having the love. I, I hear this word repeated more often than any other word. I love you. Do you love me too? And if you say no, then I hate you too. <laughs> this kind of love is no love. And what's the difference that we experience from the love of a perfect living master, a Sant Sat Guru? That love is totally unconditional. There is no judgment involved in that. We judge people all the time. They are constantly saying who is good and who is bad, who is better. The perfect living master never does that. He never judges us. His love is not based upon how good or bad we are. His love is based upon the fact that our soul, our spirit, our consciousness is pure. 
it is not sullied by anything except our own mind. And he looks beyond the mind because he has not come to look at our faces in the physical body. He has not come to look at our minds. He has not come to look at what we think. He has come to look at our souls. He has come to look at the consciousness in us and he can see it. And therefore his love becomes unconditional with no judgment involved at all. This unconditional love is such a unique feature of a perfect living master. He distinguishes such a master from all of us because we somehow succumb to this judgment, talking ill of people, making judgments all the time, gossiping around. We love to do that thing, which is alien to a perfect living master because he can see the spirit trapped in a mind, trapped in a body, trapped in a physical world, trying to escape from here and cannot escape. He can see what kind of prisons we are, we are enclosed in. And therefore, he's come here to get us out of the prison. He's not come here to judge us or to say who's good and bad, who will go to heaven, who will go to hell. He's not coming for that at all. He's coming to give us true salvation to such kind, our true home. He wants to take us back beyond the mind. And therefore, the unconditional love is such that if you find a perfect master and deal with him on a daily basis, you will find he will never judge you. He will love you if you love him. He will love you if you don't love him. He will love you if you hate him. And he will love you if you kill him. That's the kind of unconditional love a perfect living master gives. It makes him a unique person. And yet, as a person, he's just like us. He's having a physical body like ours. He's born, grows up, falls sick, takes medication, dies like us. The physical body is no different than ours. He speaks with the same mind, learns languages like us, and yet he's so different because his consciousness, his awareness, is not tied up with these things. He knows these are only temporary vehicles we are using. This physical body is merely a vehicle. We use it for a short time. What, 50, 60, 100, 120 years? Nobody uses it more than that. The physical body has a very limited life. We die, he dies too, in the physical body. And the mind has its own life. The sensory perceptions have their own life. They all have different spans of life. They all die. Even the mind dies, maybe after a long period. But the soul, the consciousness never dies. We are talking of the immortal soul. The master comes for the immortal soul. He does not come for these temporary covers. While we begin to misidentify ourselves with these covers, he does not misidentify. He knows he's the soul wearing these covers, wearing these costumes, as it were, for a particular act. For playing in this world a certain role, we are wearing these costumes. And he's aware of it. And we are not aware of it. We think we are the costumes. We think we are the physical body. We think we are the sense perceptions. We think we are the mind, the thinking mind. We object all the time, say, I think this is so. As if I and the thinking machine is the same thing. We don't realize the thinking machine, the mind, is installed in consciousness. It's not consciousness per se. It's installed as a machine, as an accessory to consciousness. Consciousness powers it. Consciousness makes it alive. Consciousness gives life to the mind. Consciousness gives life to our sense perceptions. And consciousness gives life to the physical body. And through these vehicles, we create experiences around ourselves. When we have a physical body, a whole material world comes into being around us. And all our contacts are through a material physical world. The physical world would not be there if we don't have a physical body. The physical body is responsible for our experience of a physical world. The sensory perceptions, which can exist without the physical body. A person who dies, he only dies in his physical body. His sense perceptions still survive. He can still see, he can talk, walk, everything, but we can't see him because he's no longer in a physical body. But he can. And we call them ghosts and spirits and we call them different disembodied names and we get frightened of them. 
the very person we love so much who dies and becomes a ghost and we run away from that ghost. The person is the same. He just not got a body. A disembodied person has another life. And if you can have that experience, you will find out that you don't die in the astral body or the sensory body, even though the physical body dies. The astral body or the sensory system survives. Not only survives, it can be reborn into a physical body again and have a creation, a physical creation to walk in and to live in again. But while it is not in the physical body, it still has a creation around itself. But it's not a physical creation. It's the sensory creation. It's the creation of a subtle type from which all this physical creation is coming into being. So there is a world existing beyond this world which we experience after death and we experience before we are born and we experience every time in the intervals between the two events. But that world we can only see through the disembodied body. This physical body blocks us from seeing that world. When we leave the physical body, we see that world. Now the question is, here I am talking to you in a physical body, you are listening to me in a physical body. Can we have access to that state of disembodied bodies looking at something else, a different world? Can we see those worlds while we are still in the body? Can we see that while we are alive in this body and before we die? Can we die while we are living? Is it possible to die while we are living? And the answer given by these mystics, the saints, is yes, we can do it now. We don't have to wait to die physically to see that other world. We can see it now. now. How is that possible? That we should be able to see another world which we only normally see after we physically die. What is the process by which we can die while living? The process is simple. The process is that if you see how a person dies in the physical body, if you have gone to hospital or if you have a terminal illness in, in any relatives or somebody that you have seen dying slowly, you will notice that death does not come suddenly over the whole body. Death creeps from the limbs, from the extremities. When a person is dying, first the, the dying person does not know where the hands have gone, where the feet have gone. Then the legs have disappeared. Then the arms have disappeared. It proceeds in a certain order that the extremities die first. And the person is still talking to us. He says, can you move my leg this side? The leg is already there. He doesn't know where the leg has gone. He doesn't know where the hands have gone. And eventually the torus starts disappearing. The lower part of the body disappears. Still talking to us. Eventually, as he dies in the whole body, he cannot speak anymore. He's still looking at us and moving his eyes. And then when the death goes to the head, to the eyes, then his brain dead, he's dead, he's gone. So it's a process. His dying is a process of leaving the body. The life force or the astral body or the sensory body is withdrawing from this body in a certain orderly way. That's what is death. It can happen quickly or it can happen slowly over time. Now, how about simulating this? That means pretending to do the same thing which happens in death. That means, can you do something by which you can become unaware of your hands and feet, unaware of your legs, unaware of your body gradually in the same order, ultimately unaware of the whole body going into the head? It's possible. Because what is making us aware of our extremities of this body is our attention. Our attention is scattered into the body and through the body, through the sense perception, scattered all over the world. Supposing we pull this attention back and pull this attention back to the very point where eventually the body dies, which is in the head, behind the eyes. Supposing we find out that there is a single point behind these physical eyes and that's the point where we eventually die physically and the whole of the atten attention is withdrawn to that point and then we say his brain dead. 
maybe that point is somewhere in the brain, in the center of the brain, maybe near the pituitary body, maybe near the pineal gland, somewhere in the center of the head, there's a point where the physical body dies. How about putting our attention deliberately at that point? How about thinking of nothing else but something, the point behind our eyes? How about closing our eyes, closing our ears, and just looking at what is inside my head? Can I be aware of what's inside my head? Just concentrate on being at a point behind these eyes, as if it were a third eye, as if it were the combination of the two eyes where they see the outside world. You know, when we look through the two eyes, we are not seeing two images, they are joining together. And the two images of the two eyes are different and they join. Where do we feel that we look at the world? Have you ever noticed? Do we see from the eyes or do we see from behind the eyes? If you were to see from the two eyes, you would see two worlds. But we see single because the merger takes place both externally and internally at the center of the two eyes, between the two eyes, behind it. Just like my two fingers are there, if these were the two eyeballs, where the two fingers join, it's precisely that point where we, we are seeing right now. If you want to know where are we seeing things from, we are seeing from the same point. Where is, what is that point? People have called it the single eye because that's where the whole process of seeing becomes single. They call it the third eye. They call it the point. They call it the center of consciousness. They call it the center of wakeful consciousness. So many words have been used to describe that single point inside. What if we imagine and pretend that we are there and all our attention is concentrated there? What would happen? You can try. If you try and think only of that, you'll notice the first thing that happens is you don't know where your feet and hands have gone. Gradually, the attention pulls itself. You don't know where the legs have gone. Precisely the same order of withdrawal of consciousness, withdrawal of awareness takes place as it takes place in real death. That means there is a means available to us to simulate death itself and have the same experience which death will give us and have it while we are living. Everything else is intact. The vital organs are working. The body is alive and yet we are withdrawing our awareness back to the eye. And then what happens? If we can withdraw our attention completely and become unaware of this physical body, we find we are still alive. We find we have a body. We find we are moving around. We find we can fly. We find that's a different kind of a body. It still has the same perceptions. We can still see, touch, taste, smell. We still have the sense perceptions and yet the physical body is no longer active. Another example would be at a lower level of consciousness that when we go to sleep, what do we do? What is sleep? Sleep is a withdrawal of attention from this body. And we go into a dream state. In the dream, we have another body. The dream body that runs around. The physical body is lying in bed and the dream body is running around having a dream. What is that body? Where does that come from? If you notice, and if you are an expert in understanding the movement of consciousness during wakeful state and sleep state, and withdrawal of consciousness behind the eyes, if you look at these facts, you will notice that sleep does not take place by withdrawal of attention behind the eyes. It takes place by lowering of attention to the throat center. That's a very interesting thing. People sometimes don't notice that when they go to sleep, what they think are their eyes, the position of the eyes shifts and becomes lower. And I give them a little example. I say, when you are about to sleep at night, feeling sleepy, drowsy, try to touch your eyes with your eyes closed. In the wakeful state, anybody can, with eyes closed, touch the eyes, know where the eyes are. When you're drowsy, try it. And you touch your nose and think you are touching your eyes. If you are still more sleepy and can still do this exercise, you touch this. Gradually, your center where you think the eyes are is shifting down. And when it goes to the throat, you are in dream state. You can tickle somebody just slightly 
in the throat who is sleeping and the dream sequence will change. You can wake him up and ask him that he was seeing something different. So many studies have been done on sleep consciousness, on dreams, but not enough done on the consciousness that you can retain by putting your attention deliberately at the eye center behind, not going below, and then becoming unconscious of this body and opening up the consciousness of another body. This is practical for anybody to do. It's a first step in realizing that this physical body is not ourself. It's merely an experience. It's merely an experience, a cover upon ourselves. That a real self is operating within this body. That even if this goes, we are still there. And this can be practiced and people can have experience of this. This, what I am talking about, is a little different from an out-of-body experience. In an out-of-body experience, you still think that you stepped out of this body. And you see this body, you stepped out and walked in. That's another exercise. It's an exercise in imagination. You can solidify your imagination to the point where you can feel that the imaginary self that has just moved out is actually real. You can put more attention on the imaginative body that you create and can make it more real, which is also possible. And people have those experiences. But then, since the consciousness of this body remains in an outer body experience of that kind, people say we are connected with a silver cord, some kind of a connection with the body, and we, they, uh, that body tries to pull off. We are afraid. If we move too far away from the physical body, that might snap and we'll die. That fear is not there if you are withdrawing your attention by regular practice behind the eyes. <clears throat> the gateway to understanding that this body is not ourselves but another body exists is behind the eyes. We have these apertures on our body. They call nine doors. The two eyes, the two nostrils, the mouth, the two ears, the two lower apertures. These nine doors open our attention outward. They connect us to a physical world that we observe outside. They do not give us any information of what's happening inside. The tenth door lies behind these eyes. That point that I'm mentioning, that point which we call the third eye, is the tenth door that opens inwards. Unless you go to the tenth door and open that, you do not know that there is anything more existing than the physical body. And that's why in the spiritual path it becomes important to have an experiential evidence of what exists inside you. And therefore meditation becomes very important. What is meditation? It's the art of withdrawing your attention through concentration of attention behind the eyes inside you. Meditation is nothing more than that. Good meditation is to withdraw your attention to the point behind the eyes. Other kinds of meditation people practice is to withdraw your attention to other energy centers that lie below, behind, uh, below the eyes. This whole body and its energy functions are taking place through different centers, different organs of the physical body and different organs of the sensory body. And those organs are operating at different levels, compatible with this physical body in the same shape. And those go to the heart and to the navel and to the genitals and to the bottom. These centers of energy are responsible for all our experiences of energy, including extended energy, including aroused energy. Every kind of energy that we have experienced, actually experienced through these centers, the chakras, the six chakras as they call them. But they do not give you any higher awareness. They give you different experiences of energy. But none of them has ever given a higher experience of who you are. They give you strange experiences, unusual experiences. But none of them ever tell you who you really are. And that you are neither this physical body, nor sense perceptions, nor your mind. You are the soul. Your consciousness per se. So therefore, there is a big difference in the practice of meditation for the six lower chakras, which is practice of developing new kind of energetic experiences and the practice of higher awareness, awareness that comes from the eyes, behind the eyes and above. These physical eyes are a great dividing point 
in this physical body of ours. They contain the energy centers below and they contain the awareness centers in the short space between the eyes and the top of the head. So therefore, if you want to have just unusual experiences of energy, you can go to these other centers, especially the heart center. A lot of people practice thinking the self resides in the heart. The emotional self resides in the heart. You can experience it. You can experience all kinds of emotional things by going to the heart center. But no awareness, no higher awareness of who you are. That only comes from behind the eyes, further behind the eyes and above the eyes. So that is why this is a big dividing line. The yogis in India have been practicing for a long time the different development of energies in these chakras. Have recorded notes about them. But the saints and mystics who have given awareness of our own true self have never talked of these. They have talked of the third eye and the eyes above that, which we can see. And all the journey to our true home lies between these eyes and within and the top of the head, within the physical body. When we can have an experience of life after death while we are living, we can have an experience of everything that we can ever dream of, including the origin of life itself, the origin of consciousness. It can be experienced right while we are in this physical body right here. Because the centers which are connected with all those levels of consciousness all are sitting right here in our physical body at this time. The physical body is the most perfect piece of creation in this entire universe. Nothing has been created better than this little equipment, five, six feet big equipment in which, which we call a physical body, in which all this information has been all packed together and which can be opened up by anybody. This is not a religion. To open up your inner doors and see who you are it is not religion. It is not a society. It not, does not belong to any particular group. It does not belong to any race, does not belong to any country. It belongs to all human beings without exception. And this can be tested out. And this experience can be generated by a child five years old, an old man of hundred years old. There's no time limit, no gender limit, no race limit, nothing at all in this. This is a gift given to us. And this physical body, human physical body is distinguished from all other living forms. According to some of the scriptures in India, they say there are as many as 8.4 million species of living beings, all different living beings. They have listed them. More than half of them, 5.4 million, are in the plant kingdom itself. Most of them living in under the ocean. Many of them living under the ocean, which we have never seen. So these species are all living things. They all have consciousness in different forms. They all have souls. And yet, out of all this 8.4 million species, there's only one species called the human species, the human being, which has that special unique power to be able to go back and touch all these centers within the body and have access to what is before, after life, to know the origin of life itself. And to go and merge in the origin of consciousness, totality of consciousness from which everything has been created. And have that experience while we are sitting here in the physical body. I can't think of a greater miracle than this. That a miracle can allow us to sit in a physical body and have experiences of the origin of the whole creation. And to go back to that state. Yes, it's possible. Now what distinguishes this human body from all other living forms is a very unique thing that is called the experience of free will. This human body alone has that experience. Though with the mind, the senses and the physical cover upon consciousness, we still experience free will. We think we make our own destiny. We have choices. Every day we have choices. We make choices every day with using our free will. Nobody stops us. Nobody says, no, no, you can't make a choice because everything has been determined by a creator. 
we decide whether we believe in the creator or not we can be an atheist we can be a believer we can do what we like this experience of free will is so unique no other species has it the trees don't have it the insects don't have it the dogs don't have it the cats don't have it they all work by instinct pre-programmed instinct in their dna they must react the way that has been recorded with them they never say should i or should i not only human being say that should i or should i not do this only human being say this is good this is bad i should do it or i should do it and no other species does it not even angels in heaven can do that because they have all the knowledge what's going to happen if you knew what's going to happen next second your free will will disappear but just because we don't know the future is totally silent blank for us therefore we say we fill in the blanks and we make our own choices therefore this experience of free will is a very unique experience only available to the human being and to no other living form they say that even gods and goddesses who may be controlling many universes don't have it because of their knowledge and we have it because of our ignorance what a wonderful thing ignorance is bliss <laughs> that we are ignorant of the future so we have free will what would happen if we knew the future just think of it for a moment if you knew that every decision you are making and thinking i should do this or not do this and when you go to higher level and find out that all that different choice making that you were doing all the analysis you were doing which is which i should do this or do that was pre recorded long ago the whole of your discussion what you should choose is pre recorded if you knew that you would have no free will you would still go through the same process knowing i have to go through the same process you would be like trees and insects and birds and animals but we don't know we are ignorant therefore we say we have free will we have total free will experience is so real it's not that free will is a delusion it's a real experience so long as we are ignorant of the future free will will always be real what is our definition of reality our definition is that which we experience as real there is no other definition we have nothing to compare with what is real or unreal we have no comparison except what we are experiencing as real if we had two or three states of consciousness available to us we could say oh in relation to that this is real what about a dream state we go into a dream we think it's real how long does it remain real till we wake up when we wake up the dream becomes unreal it does not become unreal till we wake up because we are ignorant in a dream where we are sleeping where the body is we are ignorant the ignorance makes that real supposing in a dream we also knew we are sleeping in a bed it will no longer be real the dream will become unreal because we will know this is just an experience we are having we are actually lying in bed but since we forget that we do not have knowledge of that the dream becomes real now in the dream supposing you say i know it's a dream do you think that will make it real or unreal no because you're still telling your friends you know we we are having a dream it's all a dream and then you wake up and there are no friends around who were you telling you were telling the truth without knowing the truth that's what we do here too we tell the truth this is not real and yet we think it's real the whole reason for our free will being real is our ignorance of the future that's all and yet it's so important that the free will should be a real experience without really being free is the most wonderful gift we have got and people don't realize it that ignorance can be so valuable they don't realize it is the order of creation if you see the whole order of creation how this whole creation has come into being successively starting from totality of consciousness and oneness in which there nothing else exists except consciousness individuating for an experience of the many within the one a consciousness that becomes the many within the one so that it can experience its basic feature of love and then the one many in the one be called souls individuated souls and then those souls descending to a next order of creation and being attached to an accessory called the mind the mind which creates time and space 
and in time and space creates the law of events that go by cause and effect. That's all the mind does. Look back at the real nature of mind. The mind, the thinking machine, what is it doing? It's creating time, space and law of causation for us. Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, could recognize it even as a philosopher without doing mystical practice. He said these are the just categories of the mind. It just creates time, space and law of cause and effect. And what will happen with that? With this accessory, we enlarge our experience. Individuated, individuated consciousness, the soul, now has a mind and can experience things in time and space and link the events of time and space. Because of this, that happens. And what does that create? It creates one of the greatest laws talked about in the East, now being talked about in the West, law of karma. That it is all karma. We are going through a karma. What is karma? Karma means that if you do something, you have to bear the consequences of it. Do something good, you are rewarded. Do something bad, you are punished. This requires that there should be consequential thing, a time frame and a space in which this can happen. Imagine if we were to withdraw time and space at this moment, all karma will die. There will be no karma at all. Karma requires Time, space, and cause and effect. That is karma. Karma is no different than a function of the mind. Does the soul have any karma? Never. Soul never has a karma. And who has a karma? A machine attached to us, and we are suffering because of that machine. What lack of awareness do we have that we can not see through these games that are being played in the art of creation, and the creation that goes successively to another level, not only does time, space and causation create karma, it goes one step lower and adds on that perception by a mind should be broken up into different forms of perception. Seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, hearing all become separate. The mind doesn't require them to be separate. The mind absorbs all these at once. But we create sense perceptions and divide them. That seeing is not the same thing as hearing. The touching is not the same thing as it. And they all become independent, five independent sense perceptions. And to top it all, we cover it with the physical body of ours and say, this is me. This is the self. Because the sense perceptions can now operate through a physical system in a physical world and have all the experience of karma, cause and effect in this physical world. It's a very well laid out plan of creation. We can reverse the whole trend and go backwards and see the origin of all this within our sense right now. It is all sitting right now. The whole thing I'm explaining to you is sitting in each one of us right in our heads. Anybody can go in and check it out. It's not unique to anybody. Don't think there's some specially gifted people who have it. Others don't have it. We all have it. They're unaware of it. That's all. We are unaware. Our attention is gone to the experiences outside. Attention is not gone to where the experience is being generated. We think the experiences outside are the real thing. Our reality has been shifted. Our reality is no longer the creator, the creative power. Our reality is the creation. And the creation is our only reality, nothing else. Even we have become small, insignificant parts of this creation. The world has been there for billions of years. We only come for a little while and die. What have we done to ourselves? If consciousness, the creator of all experiences, which is our real self, sitting inside, is being fooled to such an extent by the covers we are wearing, the costumes we put on one after the other to change the scene of the drama, and just because of that reason, we should think that the reality is all outside. And inside is just a receiver of these impressions of reality outside. It's, it's a very interesting thing. Take one sense perception. Take the power of seeing. What is seeing? Seeing is, according to the materialist, doctors, scientists, seeing is rays of light reflected from things around us. If it's dark, we can't see. The rays of light are necessary. Light falls upon things, is reflected from them. Different colors are picked up. Different forms are picked up. 
thrown into the eye and through a process of going through the lenses of the optical lens, the aqueous and vitreous humor, the liquids, it gets converted into an image and the image falls in the back of the eye where the retina, which is an extended form of the optic nerve, sits there with rods and cones to distinguish between the form and color and that causes signal and that signal trans is transmitted by the optic nerve to the brain, to the right place in the brain and consciousness picks up from the brain and say, I can see this. That's the process, the well-identified process. Things come in front of us, we see them. Now imagine for a moment, just radically, Supposing the retina had the power to create pictures upon itself and the same pictures it creates that I am not talking of. We would see things exactly as they are. Supposing the retina has no power at all, the optic nerve has the power to create images. We would see the world as it is. Supposing there is no, nothing in the optic nerve, it is only in the brain cells and the brain cells generate the frequencies to see the world, we would still see the world the same way. Supposing there is nothing in the brain. Consciousness that picks up the final signal generates this. You still see the world the same way. What would happen if consciousness generates this experience? We would see the optic nerve operating on it. We would see the retina getting the picture and we will see the outside world like we are seeing. How do we know which is the cause and effect? How do we know that we see therefore things are there or things are there, therefore we see. A question that philosophers have been examining for a long time. And they tried to find an answer in the laws of cause and effect by saying whatever happens first must be the cause. Whatever happens later must be the effect. Therefore, unless a thing is in front of us, we don't see it. Therefore, that's in front and therefore that's the cause and then we see it. So much analysis has gone into it. Whether we see a thing after it is in front of us or at the same time or before. And we find through all analysis, we see simultaneously with no time gap at all. And thing in front of us, the seeing is at the same time. There's no gap at all. If there was a gap, we could say, this comes first. That I'm seeing first, then the thing is appearing. I could say that seeing is taking place inside. But since seeing and the thing are at the same time with no gap at all, we can't determine which is the causal direction. We can't say, are things creating seeing or what seeing is getting things? Therefore, we get confused. Or for the time being, since we don't know what is happening inside, we take things which are seeing as the only reality. They are the real things creating our experiences. What happens when we meditate? What happens when we really pull our attention back to the third eye center? What happens? What, are, what does the experience show? Right out. You will see that the causal direction always was from consciousness to outside and not the other way around. Looks very strange that all the realities that we are seeing are being created by consciousness. That the only building block that is needed for entire creation with its molecules and atoms and vibrations and different kind of all strange kind of happenings in this entire created universe, not only here but everywhere, is all being generated by consciousness. How is that possible? The mind will never accept it. The only way to understand it, to know it, to be there, is to go within to that point which is available to all of us right now. That's an amazing thing that this is such a practical proposition. If you want to find who you are, if you want to find what the reality of all experience is, the only way to really test it out is to go within yourself and test out where it's all happening. Otherwise, you will keep on taking the reality as reality outside of you. The beauty of this creation is, and I admire that beauty of this creation is, that whatever we experience, we take it as real. We have no standard to compare with anything else. This is the only world that's real. So people say, is it illusion or is it real? What should I call it? I can't call it illusion. I would call it illusion if I knew another reality. So I call it reality. 
but was it really real? Then I said, no, the process of illusion created the reality. The process is illusion, the creation is not illusion, it's reality. It's amazing because we have no other definition of reality. Our reality is what we experience real with what means, the means created for that reality. For example, we have the sense perceptions. I want to know, is this chair real or not? I am looking at the chair, I touch it. Oh, it's real. Why? I can touch it. I am verifying one sense perception with another, both of them created for this physical world. It is just like saying in a dream. I am having a dream and I see a chair in the dream and somebody says, you know, it's a dream chair, it's not real. And I will say, I touch it, no, it's real. And then I wake up and there is no person telling me there is no chair. And I find chair was created by the dream. So therefore, when we try to check reality by means within that created reality, we make a big mistake because we say, let us ask 40 people, are you all seeing the same thing? Yes, we are. Therefore, it's all real. They are all seeing the same thing. It must be real. And same thing has happened in dream. We meet 40 people in dream and say, is it a dream or is it real? No, they, it's all real. And we say, yes, 40 people are saying it's real. It's not a dream. And we wake up. There are no 40 people. And there is no evidence. So this is the big error we make. That our definition of reality has been based upon cross-checking with the same system of perceptions that exist for that experience of reality. So we use illusion to create different levels of reality. And the other wonderful thing about this creation is, which I admire a lot, is at one time we experience only one reality. That's a great beauty, otherwise you would never take it as real. When we go to sleep and dream, we don't keep awake. If we were also awake and also dreaming, it's called daydreaming, it never becomes real. Nobody is ever called daydreaming real. When we sleep are no longer aware of this reality, that becomes real. When we wake to this, the dream becomes dream, this becomes real. When we go to the next level of consciousness, this whole world becomes a dream, that becomes real. When we go to the next higher level, that becomes a dream, the real thing. How long does this awakening process last? Can we keep on awakening ever, forever and keep on finding at every level was a dream? Yes, we can. What do we find eventually? Supposing we finally wake up. And finally, what, do, what can we expect? Or what do we find? What have people found who have done it? And all of us can do it, by the way. It's not that some people did it in the past and we can't do it. We can all do it. Process is very simple. I can go much deeper into it and tell you the process of going to the final awakening state. When you finally awake, you find there was only one totality of consciousness and everything has been built into that, created out of that. And all levels of reality have been created from there. One after the other, shutting off one and opening up another. So it's a very beautiful way. I can't imagine a better way of doing it. Sometimes when we sit here, we see some part of this creation, we don't like it. Terrorists, murders, pain, suffering, so much going on. What is the need of creating that kind of reality? Why should we have all this negative kind of reality sitting here? It's a terrible creation in that way. How could a good creator wanting to have a new experience create all these ter terrible things? How could such terrible experiences be part of a life that's supposed to be created by a so-called good creator? It doesn't make sense at all. But then we find out that experience itself, whether it's sensory experience or non-sensory experience, it takes place by comparison with the opposite. All experience is generated in pairs of opposites. If there is no opposite, there is no experience. If there was no darkness, we would never see light. Imagine for a moment if this light that is here in this room were there all the time. And whether we close our eyes or open our eyes, all the time light was there, you would never see it. In no way you could have known it, it exists. How do we know light exists? Because we have seen darkness. If there was no unhappiness, we would never know what happiness is. If there was no pain, no pleasure would exist. If you look at it carefully, that the entire experience of consciousness is existing in pairs of 
opposites. It's a world of duality. It has to exist in pairs. And therefore, when we find immense suffering and get out of it, we find immense suffering has led us to a state of being where there is no suffering. And we could not have known that there is no suffering if there was no suffering. And therefore, a created suffering, a created illusion of suffering, leading to an awakened state of non-created happiness, makes it more happy, makes it blissful. They use these terms, bliss, happiness, joy. Why do they use those terms for the higher states of consciousness? Because of the comparison with this state of consciousness. Remember, this is all based upon the law of pairs of opposites. On the other hand, is it really necessary to create so much real terror, real pain, real suffering? Let's examine again. Supposing we went to sleep and had a dream in which we had a nightmare, a terrible dream. With so much suffering and so much pain and we didn't like it at all and then woke up. What would we say? Thank God it was a dream. That's precisely what we say when we go to a higher level of consciousness. Thank God it was just a created experience. It's not the reality to which we now belong. The ultimate reality we belong to has no suffering, no manyness, no differential no discrimination, none of the things that have been created to have that experience. In some of these old texts by the Indian saints, it's recorded that there are souls of two kinds. That in our true home, there are trillions, decillions of souls dancing and singing in joy because there is no suffering. They're having a great time there. And then there are some souls who have been out into an adventure land like ours like the physical world and other worlds like this and been through suffering, misery, all seeing all these things and then going back to our true home. And we dance, who have gone here, we dance even more than those souls. And they say, what's so special about you that you are dancing even more than we are? And we tell them, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> you don't know what you're missing in your own home because you have not seen what you got. You can only see what you got if you have seen the opposite of that. The question can arise that if that world of ours, a true world, which belongs to, where we belong, which is our true home, we call it such cunt, the true home, the true home to which we belong, where we are one in consciousness, we are one being, and therefore we experience the many in that one being. And we do not have to imagine that we are one, we are one there. In that true home, we, there is no duality at all. There is no opposite. So how can we say we can experience that place which has no opposite? When we, the law of opposite applies to everything. Well, the beauty of this creation is that by creating a world of pairs of opposites, that has become the opposite of this. If this was not there, the world of pairs of opposites, we wouldn't even experience that. It's amazing how well planned and well placed this creation is. You go stage to stage through this process and you look at this creation, you'll find it's perfect. You can't improve it. Sitting here, you can improve everything. You say, I'll write off this thing, I'll remove this element from the creation. And you see from the top, and nothing is so perfect. Everything is placed right in its right place. Therefore, the viewpoint at each level of consciousness is different. When perfect living masters who are essential for giving us this routing and taking us back home, they come into our life, they look at the world from that point of view. They look at all the levels that are going on, including this. They operate like us so that we can be friends. If, if a perfect living master is not our friend, he can't be a master. Period. Because we trust a friend. We want a friend in life. We want somebody we can share everything with. We want somebody who can guide us at every point. We want a friend in need. A friend who stands by us when we need. Not a friend who runs away. How can a human being, one human being, appear in our life and be a friend of that kind who is with us all the time and stands with us in need? The beauty of this relationship 
between a perfect living master and a friend, a disciple of his. A, a seeker who has become a friend of his. The relationship is so different because this perfect living master in a human form can manifest himself in the consciousness of the seeker. So when the seeker meditates, he can see him exactly like he is seeing him outside. He can talk to him like he can talk to the physical body. He can have the company of that person, the physical body. If one gets initiated, and I might talk a little bit more later today or tomorrow about initiation, if a seeker who is seeking the truth and wants to seek his true home is found by a perfect living master and gets initiated and meditates according to the instructions he's given in the physical body, he sees the form of that master inside as real as the form outside, if not more real. And that form, with a little practice, stays forever with you. That's a permanent friendship and permanently present friendship. Not one who disappears or one who has to be looked after, sought after. after. That's the great relationship of a perfect living master and a disciple. This friendship is permanent and accessible and visible. No other friendship is like that. I don't know them. So therefore, it's a unique form of friendship in which the two friends travel together to their true home. You don't travel alone. Nobody travels alone. You can't go even to that state. The mind is such a great obstruction. You can never go there. But the friend can pull you up and take you because while he is a friend here, he is operating at all levels at the same time. Therefore, he can take you stage by stage to the true home. I was talking of the importance of free will which makes us unique. The free will alone makes us a seeker. Nobody can seek if you don't have free will. Therefore, it doesn't matter how real or unreal it is. It gives us the power to seek and we become a seeker. And if you are a seeker, you are a candidate for going back home. Nothing more is needed. People say, is there a special qualification to be initiated and to go back home with a perfect living master? No. The only qualification is be a seeker and seek. Seek and you will find, certainly. How do you seek? Not by shouting in the street. Seek within yourself. Don't have to speak. Seek within yourself. Speak in your heart, in your mind, in your head. Ask that you want to go back to a true home in your head. And they guarantee that by coincidence, a perfect living master come into your life and take you back home. If you find teachers and masters who are not perfect living masters and you follow them also, it still doesn't matter. Still keep on seeking. Seek till they take you to a point and you want to seek more. Seek you'll find a perfect living master. The whole secret is seeking. Therefore, the importance of the illusion of free will, which is absolutely real for us here. That's why free will is so important. That's why the human body becomes so important. It's the only form that can seek and can have the freedom to say, I want this or I don't want this. So when you say, I seek, you're expressing your, your free will to seek. And that's a great experience of seeking. And that experience is responded by a perfect living master, ordinary person, an ordinary garb, human being appearing, and gradually you find out that was not an ordinary person. He looked very ordinary. He lived ordinary. What was the difference between him and us? The difference was in awareness, nothing else. He was aware of the whole thing, and we are not aware of it. Don't think that there, there's any other difference. A perfect living master is not born of some other material or made of something else. He's like us. He lives like us. Happens to be a man. He does sure, sure, sure like us. For those who don't know sure, 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 it means shit, shave and shower. I mean, he's just a ordinary person like us. So it's not that we find a distinction in physical form. A distinction is in the awareness. But he's constantly aware of this whole game right from inception to now and we are not and the only difference and how does he take us to the true home by gradually giving us the awareness stage by stage of every level of the creation that has taken place 
and showing us that the body is the last costume we are wearing for the local show here. And another inner costume that we are wearing of sense perceptions is for another world. The costume of the mind we are wearing is for another world. And then our pure soul individuated is wearing a costume of individuality. And our truth is oneness with totality, with the creator. There is no difference. That's how it comes. One other note I want to give you about this free will. Because it's a very ticklish subject. Is it real or unreal? If it is unreal, why are we being punished? If it is really or predetermined, what are we to do here? All kinds of questions come up if a free, free will is determined. The free will that is here, where, who has recorded it? If we say it's pre-recorded, predetermined. Who determined it? If somebody else determined it, then we can say we are slaves to somebody else's recording. But when we find out by going to the top, we recorded it, then it's really free. It looks like illusion here because it's illusion here and it's really free when we go to the top because we recorded it. Therefore, it's really free will. But we don't find out till the end. It was really our own record. We made it up. And therefore, now we are practicing it, using it. We are calling it free will here in illusion because we recorded the whole thing in advance. And now we are going through it and we don't know the future. So we think we are practicing free will here. But we recorded the whole process ourselves. It was in our free will. Nobody else made it up. So that's what's really free also. It's a very interesting point. And when you do more practice and go deeper into it, you'll find that free will was really free. But not here. It was free when the original determination was made. Otherwise, you can keep on saying, I have free will or do I have? People who believe in God have a big problem. And most people do believe in God. Because the definition of God is, He is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Omniscient means He knows everything. If he really knows everything, he knows what you're going to decide with your free will. If he doesn't know, if God doesn't know what you're going to decide, then he has put man above himself. He doesn't know that man can decide anything he wants. But that's not the definition of God. The definition of God is he knows everything. You can be thinking, should I do it or not do it? God knows already what you're going to do. If that is true, it can't be real free will. It must be God's will operating. This problem came up. I was studying at Harvard University and a student, we used to discuss these things, free will, every day with professor of psychology, philosophy. There was one student, bright student. He was examining this issue of free will. And he called me one day in the morning. I have found out, Eureka, I found out we have no free will. On the simple premise that I believe in God, God knows everything. If he knows what I am going to decide, how can I have real free will? That means he already knows. And so I am just going by God's will and thinking it is free will. I have no free will. I said, that's great discovery. Come over and have a cup of tea with me. So I called him over to my apartment. And before he came, I played a little trick. I got a tray ready with a cup of coffee and a cup of tea and an empty cup. So when he arrived, I said, would you like tea, coffee or nothing? I've got all three. And don't use your free will, you don't have any. <laughs> he was stumped. He said, I couldn't imagine that all my discovery can be destroyed by three cups. I didn't know that just by offering me tea or coffee, you're making me now feel I don't, I have to choose. I said, I can tell you, you are not only having free will, you're trapped in free will. Whether you like it or not, you have to use free will. Free will is the trap that creates karma. Free will is the trap that creates the law of cause and effect. If you didn't have the experience of free will, how could you have karma at all? The experience of free will is real, forced upon us, and we are trapped by it. How can we say we don't have free will? And the experience is so real. I said, if you say, I don't want coffee, you're still using free will. I want coffee, you're using free will. I want tea, you're using free will. I am showing you that free will is imminent, Necessary, 
inescapable. And you are talking that you found out that there is no free will. How could that be? How do you reconcile the two things? He got naturally stumped. He couldn't say anything. So I had to take the devil's side after that. And then tell him, no, I'll, I'll, I'll support your case now. I'll support your case that you didn't have free will. And I'll tell it in a different way. I won't go into metaphysics. I won't go into God having free will or not. I won't, I'll speak something atheists will also understand. Those who don't believe in God, they'll understand. I said, look at this. When you make a choice, what are the factors that freely allow you to make a choice? Think of it that whenever you make a choice, what happens to your mind, what happens to your brain, what happens to your mental activity that makes you say this or that? What are the kinds of factors that are responsible for choice making? Only two sets of factors. Hereditary and environmental. If your genes are carrying that your father, your grandfather liked coffee, you will take coffee genetically. You inherited this tendency to have coffee. Second set could be that you lived among coffee drinkers. You acquired the taste for coffee. Can you imagine there is no third set at all? That every time we make a choice, the factors that create the means for us to choose one or the other as one or the other, either environmental or inherited, there is no third set of factors at all. And can you imagine when you make any choice, both these things are already fixed. You can't change your environment, you can't change your inheritance, you can't change your heredity, you can't change your DNA molecule. Therefore, speaking purely from empirical, physical science, when you make a choice, you have no choice except to go by these factors, and they are fixed. So, although it looks like you are making a choice, there is no real choice. And he liked that answer, so he felt a little more comfortable. Anyway, I'm glad I got a chance to talk to you.